All right, I'm ready. Okay, um, we have two areas today that we're going to go ahead and go through. One is going to be um, strokes, and the other one is going to be on geriatrics. Now, I'm going to apologize, first of all, for this one. I'm going to, not that I'm sure you're probably really disappointed in this, but I'm going to skip, skip over a couple of the slides. Um, some of the stuff I really don't think is relevant for pre-hospital, for the most part. I kind of like to stick a little bit more on the more relevant. Um, Adam is our stroke coordinator, so he went a little bit overboard, but that's okay. It has a lot of good information in it. But um, So as we do this one, and then some of the slides are kind of don't flow as well, so I apologize if I'm not going directly with the slides. I'll kind of catch up at one point in time with them. So. <laughs> so this month we have Adam Greenberg, um, obviously the system coordinator, and Nick Tomesco from Wheeling Fire Department that put this PowerPoint together. So, what are the two different types of strokes that we have? Clot and bleed. Clot and what? Clot and bleed, yeah. Hemorrhagic um, strokes and ischemic strokes. Now, 87% of all the strokes that are had are going to be the ischemic strokes versus the 13% that are going to be your hemorrhagic strokes. There are a lot of things we can do with our lives to go ahead and prevent that we have a stroke, but there's a lot of things that we can't control, like age and our gender um, and our ethnicity. I can't say that word, but we'll try. So fifth leading cause of death in the United States right now is strokes. Um, we can see here that between men and women, it really doesn't matter. If you're a male or female, you're more likely to have a stroke regardless. And as far as the different ethnic groups, um, our blacks are 91%, Hispanics 149, and 88. So that's about all the statistics that we're going to go through. <laughs> um, I actually just was removing some of the slides too. The problem with strokes is they can be very disabilitating um, for some people. Knew a firefighter um, in the past system I was at. He was underneath one of the fire engines working on it, and someone thought it would be a funny thing to flip the siren on. And he flipped his head real quick. He had a lot, or he had some plaque built up in his carotid arteries. And when he turned his head, um, some of that plaque broke up, and he ended up ultimately having a stroke in the cerebellum area. Obviously, losing his job um, was a big enough area to add some depression, but it did other things. It caused um, some hemiparesis. So this very active man now is walking with a walker or a cane at some times, has difficulty swallowing, still difficulty with his speech. And we see what strokes can actually do to somebody long term. Um, it, it does create quite a bit of psychological and physical impact on these patients. Now, if you look, aphasia, in, um, inability to communicate, um, somewhat, yeah, about 19%, but what we see more of is hemiparesis. Remember, hemiparesis is only numbness, tingling, weakness on one side, where hemiparalysis is complete inability to move. For you guys, you go ahead and you respond to these stroke-like conditions, and or people possibly having a stroke, but there's so many things that mimic a stroke that you need to go ahead and try and figure out what's really truly going on. Big one is hypoglycemic patients or patients who are on drugs and alcohol. Um, migraines also is a big one. If you actually um, watch YouTube a lot you'll, and if you look at a news reporter live and having a stroke, she's on live TV. She's starting to talk and do her newscast and all of a sudden she turns into this gibberish talk and the paramedics came, they treated her just like she was having a stroke. But in reality she had a migraine and I can't remember the type of migraine but um, many people believed it was a stroke. So there's a lot of different things that can mimic the stroke and it's really up to you guys to go ahead and figure out what is it, what can I do to fix it, and or is it really a stroke. 
Now here are some of those risk factors I was mentioning before. Age, gender, race, not so much you can go ahead and change. However, things you can control, blood pressure, high cholesterol, AFib, if going ahead and taken care of, a lot of times, you know, with medication, they can be under control and you can reduce your likelihood of having a stroke. So we talk about the different signs and symptoms that come up and what kind of history plays into um, having a stroke. We talk about ischemic strokes. It, a patient's medical history, their past medical history, can lead you down to figure out which type it is. Um, it used to be out there that if a person was having a stroke, it was hard for us to go ahead and say, yeah, this is a bleed or this is an ischemic stroke. We don't have that CT scanner in the back of our ambulance to make that determination. We're not educated enough to make that determination. However, we've learned a lot over the last 15, 20 years, and we realize that now a patient who is or has AFib is more likely to have an ischemic stroke. We learn that um, patients with high blood pressure are more likely to have the hemorrhagic stroke. So our ischemic stroke signs and symptoms that we're generally going to see are just that of what we um, go with the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. Unequal pup or I'm sorry, um, unequal hand grips or drifting of the arm, unable to speak clearly, not just slurring the words, but mixing up our words, not being able to say that this is a mug, and these people sometimes get very confused. The thing about with ischemic stroke patients is they really understand what's going on around them. They, they understand, but they just have a hard time communicating with you, and it gets very frustrating to them. Whereas our hemorrhagic stroke patients complain of the world's worst headache, blurred vision, double vision, nausea, vomiting, projectile vomiting. And these patients do end up having altered mental status, may not fully understand what's going on around them. What's a TIA, a trans ischemic attack? What's the definition of that? It's a mini stroke, some people call it. Yeah, we do see people that will have these TIAs, and then they keep saying it's the prelude to the big one. Sometimes that's true. Some people will go their whole lives with just TIAs, versus some people, it, you know, they'll have one or two, and then they'll have a major stroke. The definition of TIA is that it is signs and symptoms, neurological signs and symptoms, that resolve themselves within 24 hours. Now, we're not going to wait 24 hours to see if those signs and symptoms resolve itself. We're going to get our patients in, treat them like they're having a stroke, and then go from there and let the hospital do their thing, do the CT scan. There's other things, too, that can mimic the stroke. Bell's palsy is one. That's that infection of the seventh cranial nerve. Um, this, uh, Meniere's disease or vertigo, paralysis, Todd's paralysis, which are types of seizures, and meningitis. So as you can see here, here's our two different types of strokes. Um, our hemorrhagic stroke is none other than an aneurysm or a burst blood vessel deep inside the brain. There's two different types. One, you have your intracerebral deep down in the brain, or you can have your subarachnoid. Our ischemic stroke, we actually have a little clot that decreases or stops blood flow to an area of the brain. And that area of the brain then becomes ischemic without oxygen. Remember, the oxygen or the brain needs oxygen and glucose to go ahead and survive. Now, yeah, he says 80% here. Um, he might have a little bit more updated statistics than what I do. With our ischemic strokes, we go ahead and we assess with the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. We have the patient hold out their arms, say something, um, smile to see if we have any facial droop. These patients we can generally do something about. We can help them out if we catch it in time. There's um, treatments such as TPA, which is fibrolytics, otherwise kind of a liquid drain over the vascular system. There is a doctor up at St. Luke's up in Milwaukee, Dr. Huja, who actually invented coiling. And he would go ahead and put a sheath in the femoral artery, go up into the brain, and then um, around that clot, coil around it and pull it out. There's other things now that they're doing. One, um, they'll shoot TPA directly at that clot. Um, they'll also go in and kind of poke at it, break it up, and they'll vacuum it out. So there are other things that they are doing for these patients other than the TPA. The nice thing about these other treatments is it doesn't have to be done in that first three to four hours either. It can be done a little bit later. Now with these strokes, 
Our big thing is the area of infarct, the area that's really ischemic, it's the outer lying tissue that we're really looking to save here. Um, we're trying to get our blood flow back to them. So for you guys, it's really important. Do you find out when were they last seen normal? When did the signs and symptoms actually start? <coughs> now our hemorrhagic strokes, like I said, the two different types, the intracerebral, deep down in the brain, and then the subarachnoid just below that um, subarachnoid um, membrane there. And these patients can be very difficult to go ahead and manage. Most of these patients that have the hemorrhagic strokes need to go to a comprehensive stroke center, a stroke center that has that interventional radiologist where they can do more for them. Yeah, I, I said something about the TIAs earlier. Like I said, I, I apologize for the slides kind of being out, or me not following the slides, but um, we don't go ahead and concern ourselves with TAs unless we know that they're starting to resolve within that short time frame. Now, a lot of people will say, well, how can I tell the difference between Bell's palsy and someone who's having a stroke? Because someone who has Bell's palsy, it looks like they're having a stroke. Their whole one side of their face is paralyzed. They have the facial droop. A lot of times they can't close their eye on their own. They're going ahead and tearing. Um, they might slur their words a little bit, but it just affects that face. It doesn't affect the arms or any other part of the body. One of the other things you can do is go ahead and try and have them wrinkle their forehead. If they have Bell's palsy, they won't be able to, but if they're having a stroke, they should be able to. And this chart kind of goes ahead and you know, tells you the likelihood between Bell's palsy and having a stroke. And you know, like inability to close the eyes, if they have Bell's palsy, on the affected side, Bell's palsy is likely where I'm a stroke, it's not. Um, inability to furrow the brow, not likely in a stroke, but likely in Bell's palsies. So you can see it looks very similar to someone having a stroke, but you can make the determination between the two. With our pediatric patients, um, yes, our peds do have strokes, but we see more hemorrhagic strokes than ischemic strokes in pediatrics. And with the charts here, it, this one shows about a 50-50, but I, I have stuff that I've read recently has said that we see more hemorrhagic strokes in children. More adults are going to be our ischemic type strokes. The problem with strokes in children is that we have a very hard time identifying them. We don't look to them right away as them having a stroke. We start looking at all the other things instead of the stroke type signs and symptoms. So it can be almost up to 24 hours after they start their um, treatments or if they start their assessments that they make that final diagnosis. With our stroke patients that are peds, we really focus on making sure those life threats are being taken care of. Now, we have a whole different laundry list here of different things that these children and why they may have a stroke. But generally, the kids that are having strokes do have a lot of other health histories. They have congenital heart diseases. Um, they take drugs, you can see. Um, leukemia, sickle cell are some of the major ones that we will see with these kids in their history. Um, again, he has two different types here. Um, when you guys get these patients to the hospital, one of the very first signs or things that they want to do is get them to a CT scan. Actually, that's the big push now um, for a lot of primary and comprehensive stroke centers is that when EMS calls a stroke alert in the field, instead of stopping in the ER and wasting five to 10 minutes there, EMS takes them straight to the, cath or to the CT scan. So the doctor would meet you at the door as you walk in, he'll do a quick few minute assessment and then on your way to the CT you actually go. Um, I'm thinking I, I think we're probably the only hospitals down in this area that are not quite doing that yet. I do know St. Francis that's one of our major goals for this year is to um, make sure we're getting that because it does take a lot of time off. American Heart had set um, point of care guidelines for us and they said in the first 10 minutes that patient has to be assessed, has to have that 12 lead. Within um, 15 minutes, a stroke team is there assessing them. Within 25 minutes, they're in CT. 45 minutes, that CT is ran, and then at an hour, making sure that the medication is being administered. Um, you can also see with kids, too, arterial uh, ischemic strokes. 45% of the time, you're going to see the hemiparesis, and we will see it pretty much abrupt in our children. 
and 26% of the time they may have seizures. So what are our signs and symptoms? Well, ischemic stroke, these patients are going to, again, complain of hemiparesis. They may have facial droop, um, <coughs> slurred speech. And again, it's not just slurred speech. It could be just gibberish that they're talking. It could be that they're trying to say the word. They can't remember what they need to say. They're usually pretty with it. They understand what's going on around them. Um, they get very agitated, so you might even see heart rate and blood pressure go up a little bit because they're trying to communicate with you and they can't get across what's going on. Our hemorrhagic strokes, this happens very acutely. Really bad headache. The patient may complain of the world's worst headache. They may have syncopal episodes, um, nausea, vomiting, that projectile vomiting, blurred vision, double vision. And they have the, like I said, the decreased mental status, so they may not be able to answer all your questions. So. We are very cautious in administering TPA in our children. TPA is a great drug, but it has a lot of complications to it. Um, in reality, only about 2% of the population can qualify for it. And some of the things that will disqualify people is recent trauma, um, previous strokes, previous heart attacks, even have gone to the dentist within the last 48 hours. Because everywhere that that patient may likely bleed, it can be very difficult to manage the bleeding. So, um, with TPA, they make sure that they do let families know exactly um, what, the, what the risks are when they're administering TPA. But ultimately, kids will have better outcomes than older patients with the similar injuries. Okay? They can have worse acute periods of stroke, but in the long term, they usually do a little bit better. So you guys, you get a call, someone having stroke-like symptoms. You start your assessment. The very most important piece of information for you to document is when were they last seen normal? When did signs and symptoms start? Because that's going to make a difference whether they can receive one or another type of treatment. We're looking to possibly administer the TPA to them. Now, our protocols still say within that first three hours. American Heart, with their new 2015 changes, said they can go up to about four and a half hours. Some doctors, based on the patient, may actually go as long as six hours. Yes, sir? Why do they give it? Farther out. I mean, what is um, nothing really happens. The likelihood of them getting the neurological deficits back is greatly diminished. And then the likelihood with the risk of the medication doesn't weigh out with the benefits. So really there's, it's, no, it's worth a shot, you know, sometimes. It's about $5,000 a dose. So yeah, pretty expensive medication. But when it works, it does a great thing. And yeah, that's the whole goal. We're trying to get those neurological deficits to reverse themselves. And if it works, it's a great thing. Now, um, some of these other different types, like coiling, can be up to eight hours. The vacuum cleaner, where they actually break up the clot there and vacuum it out, can be as long as 12 hours down the road. Now, those, they're not really looking at restoring the neurological deficits. What they're looking at doing is just clearing the clot out of the way. Our next thing we want to make sure we do is get a glucose. Um, as embarrassing as this is, I think it's a good learning uh, tool. It was something that happened to me many years ago. Pretty much brand new medic. Um, and where we live, we're a small community hospital that really just only fix boo-boos. And we fly all of our heart attacks and our strokes up to Milwaukee. Bound to determine this guy was having a stroke. Called in a helicopter. And I was so focused on him having a stroke, making sure I was getting the IV and everything, getting them ready for the helicopter, that I completely forgot to take a blood glucose. Life for Life actually had thought that I had done my job and so and was written in there the glucose. And so they didn't do one either. Doctor got up there at, or up at St. Luke's and said, what's the guy's glucose? Guy ended up having a glucose of 28 couple um, amps of D20 or D50, couple hours, four hours, I think he stayed, and was back home with a huge helicopter bill. And uh, I mean, but now, you know, <laughs> very expensive learning for his, on his part, but you know, it was very embarrassing for me. Ended up in medical director's office the whole nine yards. But I'll never forget to check a blood glucose, blood glucose again on a stroke patient. So some of the other things it's important to know too, past medical history. 
Does this patient have a history of AFib, um, peripheral vascular disease, DVTs? Those kind of things can lead us to think that this is an ischemic stroke versus someone who has high blood pressure, diabetes, um, some of those other conditions that might lead us to believe it's a hemorrhagic stroke. So we do our Cincinnati stroke scale. That's probably the easiest stroke scale to do. There's the Los Angeles stroke scale. That's it's about a page long, takes a little bit more time to do. The hospital will do the NIH stroke scale, which is about two pages and takes a lot longer to go ahead and go through. So um, some of the other signs and symptoms, they may actually have respiratory abnormalities or even difficulty swallowing. So be very careful if you are giving your patient anything orally that um, they're able to actually swallow. Um, we do the Cincinnati stroke skill. Obviously we have the patient smile. This can be done at the same time that you're doing the glucose. I hear so many people arguing, well should I do the Cincinnati first or should I do the glucose check first? You can do them at the same time while you're talking to your patient. You know, have your patient hold their arms out, palms up, eyes closed. We have them close their eyes because a lot of times um, if they start seeing their arm drip, they try and compensate for that. There used to be a specific phrase that we wanted them to say that supposedly used words that really enunciated a lot of different types of speech, but it really doesn't matter. Are they saying those words in the correct order? Are they using the correct words or are they slurring their words? So American Heart put out the D's of stroke diagnosis. Detection, they are really pushing a lot with radio commercials and TV commercials for the general population to go ahead and identify if someone's having a stroke. Um, calling you, getting EMS en route. Once EMS is there, are they able to go ahead and identify? Okay, so you guys identify, and then letting the hospital know. I know that a lot of you think, well, why am I calling the hospital, letting them know early? If we have someone who's in the CT scanner when you guys call, if it's not an emergency that they're there, we can clear that CT scanner and get ready for your patient. So the sooner you let the hospital know, um, the better we can kind of align all the stars up for this patient to go right through the process. <laughs> so they go ahead and, you know what, I'm just going to skip a couple slides here again. We assess the ABCs. We get their glucose levels. Oxygen if SATs are less than 94%. If blood glucose is less than 60, we'll give dextrose. How many of you guys in this room um, remember being taught years and a long time ago, if someone was having a hemorrhagic stroke, you didn't want to give them D50 because that tissue necrosis, if the dextrose leaked out into the brain. I know that they taught that for many, many years, and that's actually a myth, to be very honest with you. Um, by the time the dextrose gets into the system, works its way actually through the heart, through the blood, and actually gets to the brain, it's going to be so diluted that it's not going to cause tissue necrosis in the brain. And it's actually more detrimental to the patient to have a lack of glucose than it is to have dextrose. So, you can kind of cross that off your list of things that you remember from years ago. Get that last known well time. If someone wakes up in the morning and they have weakness on one side, they went to bed at 10 o'clock last night, they would not be eligible for TPA because we don't know exactly when the stroke happened. But if someone was up, they're making their breakfast and all of a sudden, you know, they felt that weakness come on, um, maybe a headache, then we at least know that the general time frame. Here's our that algorithm I was telling you a little bit about. We're trying to actually cut these first 10 and 15 minutes out by having them go directly to CT. Now Cleveland, Ohio right now actually has an ambulance 
that is staffed with a physician, a nurse, and a paramedic, and they actually have a CT scanner. So they're going out, they're having very good results with um, patients. They're doing CT scans right on scene, um, getting them and taking them to the appropriate hospitals. Like I tell you, you guys are going to be hauling a trailer behind you here soon. So. Now, we ultimately, in 2012, the state of Illinois put a law together, or the law passed, that you must transport to a primary or comprehensive stroke hospital. We're very fortunate in this area because all the hospitals in this area are stroke ready, or not stroke ready, but primary or comprehensive. Um, this really affected more hospitals down in Chicago with them bypassing one to get to another. And it created quite an uproar. But we want these hospitals to the appropriate place. Um, so they can get the treatments. A comprehensive stroke center is someone who has 24-7 stroke care, someone who has an interventional radiologist in-house 24-7. Those um, interventional radiologists, they're very expensive to keep on staff. Primary stroke centers, um, we have a certain time frame for us to get these strokes handled. And that's what we are at St. Francis. And you can see here in Region 10, and there's some hospitals that are not in Region 10 here, but um, currently Lutheran is a comprehensive and Presence Resurrection is waiting their final certification for their comprehensive stroke center. So it really doesn't concern you. I mean, it's not something like you guys have to make any major decisions with these patients because all hospitals can go ahead. All right, let's just do a review of the protocol. Routine medical care. If you have a patient who you believe is having an ischemic stroke, how important is it for you guys to start that IV on that patient? No, it's really not, not at all. Um, there's, I always tell people there's two types of patients that are low to go. One is a trauma and one is a stroke. All the other patients we can stabilize on scene and then we can go ahead and transport them. But these are two types that have, you know, have specialties. So we go ahead, we do our routine medical care. We make the determination of when the signs and symptoms started. We get a blood glucose. And then if blood glucose is less than 60, we can either get dextrose or glucagon. Do the Cincinnati stroke scale. One of the reasons why, um, you know, if you have an IV site, you're really good at doing IVs, it looks like it's an easy IV stick, fine, go ahead and do it. Um, we're not going to tell you not to. But we don't want you making them into a pincushion either because of the fact that every time you poke them, it could cause, if, they, if we give them TPA, it'll be a spot for them to go ahead and bleed. Um, and the other thing too, I mean, I'm more of a big proponent that not everybody needs to have an IV established. How about a 12 lead? How, is import, how important is it for you to do that 12 lead in the field for that stroke patient? You know, we do need a 12 lead on the patient. I will tell you that we want to make sure that, you know, um, just that full assessment. But I don't want you to delay transport either to run that 12 lead. If you're trying to get the patient out of the house, it's available to you. You can usually do a 12 lead in a couple minutes. That's fine. But don't sit there on scene specifically for that 12 lead. To be done. Um, also, we have the Cincinnati stroke scale. Now, if we suspect a patient is maybe having a hemorrhagic stroke, meaning they have neurological deficits, increased intracranial pressure, and remember, you have Cushing's triad, which is elevated blood pressure, low heart rate, and erratic respirations with these patients. So, other things to look for, unequal pupils. We're going to go ahead and try and lower the ICP. Now, we can do it a little bit, but I mean, it's not going to be a whole lot. Remember, oxygen causes vasoconstriction. CO2 causes vasodilation. And we have to find that nice, happy medium to restrict or constrict those blood vessels enough to slow down the bleeding, but not so much that we decrease perfusion pressures within the brain. So our protocol says ventilate once every three seconds. You guys have a really great tool available to you that um, can even assist you even more with this, and that's your capnography. Normal capnography, or end tidal CO2, is 35 to 45. The Traumatic Brain Foundation actually stated that if you keep between 30 and 35, right around 33 is a good number, keep your end tidal CO2 for someone having increased intracranial pressure 
Um, that's effective enough at this point that we can start to reduce the intracranial pressure a lot. We don't have the special drugs to go ahead and do that, um, but, sorry. Yeah, no, it's my thing, I gotta call. Um, so it's at least the start. We're trying to reduce the intracranial pressure to some degree. This would be a good candidate for drug-assisted innovation also. So you can go ahead and use that. Anybody have any questions on our stroke protocol? It's pretty straightforward. Biggest thing is getting that time of symptoms, getting a blood glucose. If available and if, you know, if you're able, do a 12 lead, but don't delay transportation for it. Next thing we take a look at is um, elevated blood pressure, hypertensive crises. We consider anybody having a hypertensive crisis if systolic blood pressure is 220 or diastolic is greater than 140. Doesn't have to be both, it can be one or the other. And we're seeing the other signs and symptoms like nosebleed, um, bad headache, unequal pupils, visual disturbances, double vision, blurred vision. So we're gonna do our routine medical care. Here we're gonna take a blood pressure in both arms, making sure we're confirming. Um, monitor our vital signs. Do a neuro check for these patients. So which one is it? This one. 120 or 140? Oh, you got everyone liking your name. <laughs> oh, I, I have this stupid iron responding on our phone for our rescue squad, and I can't figure out how to shut it off. Oh, yours works? Good at hammer. Yeah. That's pretty good. Get a bigger hammer. Huh? Yeah, and so I can't figure out how to shut it off. And so you guys have iron responding here? Does it work for you guys? I'm sorry, it is 120, my mistake. Yeah, I'm falling back on another protocol, sorry. Um, yes, 120, 220 or 120. So, and it has to be one or the other, it does not have to be both, okay? Now, with these patients here, um, there's not a whole lot we can do. We can go ahead and give them Lasix, 40 milligrams IV. Um, if they're already on Lasix or a diuretic, we can bump it up to 80, but that's really all we have at this point in time um, to reduce blood pressure. Um, I'll be honest with you, we'll probably be looking at taking Lasix out of our protocols um, with this rewrite. You know, we're, we haven't seen the great benefits for pre-hospital. Um, here it also talks about nitro. Nitro is a great medication to help reduce blood pressure, but if this patient is having a true ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke, we don't want to give the patient nitro. We'll just make the bleed even worse. So we need to contact medical control. Make sure that you've gone through, when you're giving your report, have as much information for that physician as possible. Make sure you're getting, you know, all the neurological signs and symptoms, a good neuro check done on these patients. Blood pressure patient's history, what medications they're normally on. The, that type of information is going to be very helpful for that physician to make the determination if nitro should be given or not. <coughs> so, yeah, um, TPA given three to four, and I've really actually already covered this. Does anybody